All right. In this video, I want to get into this very in-depth, simple, short story. This has been a very interesting topic to think about and to dissect. And I'm sure there's just so much more to uncover. But this is just... Uh, I guess it's just beautiful is what it is. Now, what I want to get into is what you see here, the thief on the cross. I thought this picture was pretty good here. You can see that the thief's hand looks relatively healthy and strong. And the Lord is so beaten here that this just looks like a disgusting agony going on right here yet he's still reaching over and I just thought this was pretty touching that's what I was that's why I was like you know what I'm gonna put this up here I'm probably gonna even use it as a thumbnail I mean it's pretty pretty touching I mean the picture's worth a thousand words right but anyway uh, this story is is good to teach anybody about salvation by faith alone and it, it can be used to actually win people over you know to get them saved to get them saved by the faith right and yeah i i guess i'll i'll just get into this here cuz there's so much I want to say at once that my mind's going all crazy here and I, I can't really get anything out. So I'll just get into the scriptures here and then go from there and talk about it. All right. In Matthew chapter 27, uh, starting at verse 38, we read about Jesus when he's being crucified and what's going on at this time. It says here at verse 38, Then there were two thieves crucified with him, one on the right hand and one on the left hand. And this is interesting because it reminds me of what Jesus talked about in Matthew chapter 25 about him separating the sheep from the goats. Right? He's going to put the goats over on the left and the sheep over on the right. So I imagine... The thief we're talking about is on the right of Jesus here. And they that passed by reviled him, wagging their heads and saying, Thou that destroyest the temple and buildest it in three days, save thyself. If thou be the Son of God, come down from the cross. Likewise also the chief priests mocking him with the scribes and elders said, He saved others, himself he cannot save. If he be king of Israel, let him now come down from the cross, and we will believe him. He trusted in God, let him deliver him now, if he will have him, for he said, I am the Son of God. The thieves also, so both of them, which were crucified with him, cast the same in his teeth. So everybody there, even the two thieves crucified with him, when they're being put to death themselves, joined the people who were putting them all to death in mocking Jesus. You see, because their mindset is the same mindset we generally have, isn't it? Where we're like, oh, you're, a, you're of God, or you are God, then prove it, right? You're not going to just let me punch you in the face and throw you on the ground and spit on you, you're going to do something about it, right? I mean, you'll just have the earth open up and swallow me or strike me down with lightning or, you know, you, that's what we think, right? Because we think if I was God, if you did that to me, I would just disintegrate you with my mind, you know? You, you would do something that you think, you know, is godly, you know? You don't treat me like that. Who do you think you are? And, you know, you vaporize them with your eye lasers or whatever you would do if you were God, right? 
you know, some crazy thing that people wouldn't disrespect you, right? But Jesus is not like that. Not at all. He's a completely different spirit. And even though everybody was doing this to him, we jump over to the same story in Luke chapter 23. And instead of calling them thieves, it calls them malefactors. Or they're criminals. And it's right after they're doing the same thing. All right? It says in the... And there were also two malefactors led with him to be put to death. And that represents us. Because like I was just saying, we have that same mentality, right? We don't believe, right? And we're all condemned. And even though the world condemns us, you know, we still, we want to be accepted by the world, right? So we join the world and it's mocking and it's scoffing. Even though the world rejects us and wants to put us to death, rightfully so, we still want to be part of the world and be joined with the world and accepted by the world, right? We care what other people think because we have all the religious leaders and everybody else there, the guards, which would be the police and all this stuff. They're all joining in on this and railing on Jesus. And we want to be part of the majority and part of the group and all that. So we see that's exactly what these thieves end up doing, right? And, uh, you know, it tells the same story. The malefactors being put up there, nailed to the cross with them. But it kind of skips over the part where they really railing into them, right? So we get an idea of that that's going on here, but it doesn't really say that right here, right? It, it says they're, they're nailed to the cross, and this stuff is going on, but then it says, Jesus says, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do, and they parted his raiment and cast lots for it. And the people stood beholding, and the... Rulers also with the with them derided him, saying, He saved others, let him save himself. If he be Christ, the chosen of God. And the soldiers also mocked him, coming to him and offering vinegar and saying, If thou be the king of the Jews, save thyself. Right? But he's saying, Forgive them, for they know not what they do. And that triggers... Something on one of these thieves, one of the male factors here. He starts to realize who's crucified next to him. Right? This guy, he lived a criminal life. And God's standards are higher than I standards, right? Where we're like, yeah, we're good people. Why, you know, we would go to heaven, right? But God looks at us and goes, well... You lied before in your life, so you're a liar. You know, I don't let liars into my kingdom. Uh, you've probably stolen something. Whether you stole something with your child, you stole some candy bar from a store, or you stole credit for something that you didn't actually do. You know, there's different things you can steal without stealing something uh, physical. You can steal, like I said, somebody's credit somebody's joy. You can steal a lot of different things. Uh, you've hated people to the point where you probably wanted to kill them yourselves if you could get away with it, right? Those kind of things God doesn't let into his kingdom. And we all deserve death because we are, we are shitty people if we admit it. We actually look at ourselves through the lens of God we're like, hey, we we are pretty shitty people. You may maybe next to other men and other women, we may look pretty good, pretty decent. We can say, well, I'm better than some of these people. I mean, I'm better than that child molester. That guy's a a psychopathic murderer. That guy he steals from the poor. You know, I'm better than these people. But you look over towards 
Jesus like this thief does, and you're like, okay, I'm in the same boat with all these people. I'm in the same boat with the pedophiles and the murderers and the rapists and the thieves and all these horrible people. I deserve to be in that same boat. But on top of that, these people who are crucified next to Jesus, the world thinks they deserve death as well. So, they're up there, and death is death is coming. You know, some people last uh, a few days hanging up there on the on the cross there. So who knows how long it's be, but you're gonna be up there till you die. And yeah, the, there's nothing that the thief can do, right? There's no works this guy can do. Uh, that's the whole point to show that. You're not saved by getting baptized, by taking the sacrament, by confessing your sins. You're not confessed by uh, repentance in the sense of turning away from sin. If you turn to God, which is exactly what this thief does, and just call on Jesus by faith, in, in the faith that he is God, that he pays for your sins and forgives your sins and will cleanse you and take you into his kingdom. You got that faith and just ask him, that's what saves you. And that's what we see right here, right? After Jesus shows that he he's not going to rain fire down on them, strike them down with lightning or an earthquake, open up and swallow them up. No, he's saying, forgive them. They don't realize what they're doing. Right, because they really don't believe who he is, and he knows our mindset. He's lived among us. He knows that we think God would just squash you like a bug if he hates you, and if he loves you, he's gonna bless you with riches in this world. Right, that's our mindset. But the Book of Job is to show us that no, just because you're you're righteous doesn't mean you're not gonna suffer anything, and just because you're evil doesn't mean you're not going to prosper in this world. Right? And it was to get you to know that when God comes in the flesh, just because he's a poor homeless man and he's treated like this, God's still going to let it happen. And this one thief, his faith is just extraordinary. I like, uh, there was something I was reading talking about how his faith surpasses that of like Abraham who had years to grow knowing God so his faith could build, right? It talks about Moses, and Moses got to speak to God through the burning bush, and all these things happen with Moses where his faith is being built up by actually seeing a lot of different things, right? And he talks about Elijah, and Elijah the same thing, experience growing with God and having miracles done. He got that faith to be built up, right? But this guy hanging on the cross, he just sees this man stripped naked, beaten to a bloody pulp where you can't even tell that he's even a human anymore. Like the depictions you see on crucifixes and in paintings of Jesus, that's very light to what happened to him. He was naked, nailed up there, and so torn apart by being whipped that his flesh was just torn up where it was like some kind of Hellraiser movie, right? And they put a crown of thorns on him, and he was probably exhausted, just hanging there, suffering, and people are all mocking him and laughing at him. And this guy was like, this is God. Right? Just in that moment, there's nothing uh, just... Uh, crazy going on to be like this guy's doing miracles he's not seeing uh, anything going on at all to be like hey this is uh, some crazy thing from god but it just clicks to him like his spirit is different he's not like men all this is going on to him and he's not cursing them or anything he's actually pleading for them 
and it the spirit touches him right and one of the thieves keeps railing on him right it says uh one of the male factors which were hanged railed on him saying if thou be christ save thyself and us right and you can see that's the whole mindset of a lot of us who are you know sinners we're like oh yeah you you truly have god well then you know do all these things that will benefit not only you but us right you know whether it be maybe something worldly like some money you know like oh you're really god get me out of this gutter give me a mansion right because youth want some kind of worldly benefit. Like, if you're God, give me everything I ever dreamed for right now. Because that's how just selfish and petty we are, really. Uh, but anyway, it says, But the other answered, rebuked him, saying, Dost not thou fear God? And that's the first thing that happens. And he recognizes this is God, and the fear of God comes over him. He's like, whoa, this guy's different. I remember as a child, I was around five. I never was brought to church or really taught anything biblical or anything. But uh, on the weekends, I would visit my, my mom. Uh, but I mainly lived with my dad throughout the week, right? Well, on the weekend... It was Easter weekend, and uh, during this time, they had a Jesus movie on. It was one where the guy who played Jesus had these, like, ice blue eyes, so you really stuck out and really looked, had a crazy look to him. Not like he looked crazy like a maniac, but, I mean, he just had this piercing look in his eyes because of those, uh, like, ice blue eyes he had. And, uh... Uh, I remember playing in the living room and just kind of paying attention here and there. And I remember seeing this guy doing miracles and all this stuff. And you're like, yeah, okay. I'm told that this is this is God here. I was like, all right. It's God. And then he was getting uh, humiliated and beaten and then put on the cross. And now I was like asking my mom, like, why? Why is he not doing anything? I mean... Look at all the stuff he could do, and he's just letting them do this. And I was all confused. Because, you know, I have that mindset, too. Of like, he's God. Why is it just, like, squash him like bugs or something, right? It's like, I wouldn't let them do that to me. I would go all kung fu on them and something, right? Karate chopped all their heads off. You know, something crazy, right? Something a kid would do, right? And I was just, like, confused. I don't even remember the explanation my mom gave. I just remember being like, what? And when I saw that, I was afraid of Jesus. I don't know if I really had a sense of like being a sinner and um, coming to Jesus as a savior. But I was scared of him in the sense that I was like, this is God. And he has the power to just destroy us if he wanted to. But we do all this stuff against him and he doesn't destroy us. And then we beat and humiliate him and put him up on a cross until he dies. Willingly, he does this. So not only does he have the power to kill us, but... Now he has motivation and reason to do so, but he doesn't. And that I found terrifying. Like, not like, oh, I was a little kid thinking Jesus is hiding under my bed or in the closet, going to come out and get me. Uh, I just felt like, uh, like, Jesus is a cool guy, but I don't want to go near him. That's how I kind of felt like. Yeah, he's loving and he's doing all this, but it's like, I, it's just, that's terrifying. And that's the thing that came over this guy. It's like, don't you fear God? He's like, and get what he gets next right here, right? 
seeing thou art in the same condemnation, right? We're all condemned. And look what he says here. And we indeed justly, for we, we receive the due reward for our deeds. So there's the next thing. He, the fear of God comes over him. Then he realizes, I deserve what I get. Like if we honestly admit everything we go through in our life, why do we think we deserve all the best? You know, bad things happen to us. There's a, probably a reason for it. Not that there has to be a reason. Sometimes like Job, you live a righteous life, but that doesn't mean everything's going to work out for you because this world is shit. And if you've got a good life and God's blessing you, everybody's going to be jealous of you and hate you. And that's why Jesus says, build up your kingdom in heaven, or I mean, build up your treasures in heaven, not your kingdom, your build up your treasures in heaven, because in this world, thieves break in and steal. Your things get old and break, rust corrupts, you know, moths eat your clothes. There's all kinds of stuff that goes wrong. And part of that is like the thieves, because people get jealous. They want what you have. So even if you're a good person, you earned what you got. Yeah, still bad things are going to happen to you. But ultimately, we do deserve it because, you know, even if it's not outward, inwardly, we hate. And there's some people we just wish would just fall off the face of the earth, right? There's uh, people we lust after. Even when we're in a relationship, we see somebody that we find attractive and we we gawk and think about them in a sexual manner. But we wouldn't want anybody to do that who's in a relationship with us, right? So we're hypocrites as well. And we, you know, we lie to ourselves. We Obviously, we, we lie to others, right? Just some of the basics there. We deserve to be up there. And that's what this guy, he, he admits. It's a, a bit of repentance, right? But he's not re calling out all his sins. He's saying just the simplest thing. I'm a sinner. I sin. He's like, I deserve being up here on the cross. I deserve hell. Right? So he got the fear of God knowing God's the one in charge. He deserves to be punished because of the sins. But look what he sees. He says next. But this man hath done nothing amiss. So he's saying Jesus has done nothing wrong. He's saying God is just. Is what he's saying there. God is just in what he does to any of us. We can't call God unjust. So he's admitting that he's a sinner and that God is righteous and just and good. Right? And, that, and this is where he takes that step of faith here because he knows that he's a sinner. God is just, but then he calls on to Jesus here and calls on to him as God, right? He says, Jesus, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. So he's like, I admit I'm a sinner. I admit you're just. Just please remember me, <laughs> right? As his last cry before he's dying, before he actually dies is, Jesus, just remember me. He has no time to get baptized. He can't partake of the sacrament, the Eucharist, you know, the, the bread and the wine there. Uh, he can't uh, repent all his sins, you know, you know, or confess all his sins. He can't do any works whatsoever, even in that simplest form, yet alone go and feed the poor and clothe them and help others. You know, take care of the widows or anything like that. He can't do anything. All he can do is admit God's judge, uh, just, admit that he's a sinner, and just call on him for help. And what does Jesus say? Verily I say unto thee, today shalt thou be with me in paradise. Right then and there, that's all it took. 
he's dying next to Jesus. And moments ago, he was mocking him. Moments ago, he was calling him out as, you're not the son of God. You're not the Messiah. If you were, you would rain fire down. You would save yourself. And you know what? Save us as well, right? He's mocking him. Maybe even spitting at him. And then he's like, oh. And Jesus forgives him right then and there. And the last thing Jesus does before he gives up the ghost is he forgives a sinner and saves him. He's still thinking about other people right at near his last breath. You can see how deep this is in just this little passage here. We've got a short paragraph, and I added a bit more from here just to show that they were both mocking him as well. And there's just so much to it. So much to the character of God, to the love of God towards us, to his understanding and patience with us, to how we can be saved and how we can uh, save others. That's why you have people who they talk about hell. Right? Because they, they want you to realize you deserve hell. That's why they talk about your sins. Like being a liar, a thief, a murderer in your heart, an adulterer at least in your heart, or adulteress. You know, try to get you to see this. Because those are the steps to lead you towards Jesus. That your soul may be saved. This guy's body, done. It is gone. His body's going to die. But his soul is saved. Because Jesus tells him, today you shall be, shall be with me in paradise. So his body... No, you need to let go of this world. And that's another teaching to this. Like I said, there's so much to this where it shows you as a follower of Jesus what your life should be like. Right? The whole world is going against Jesus. Everybody around you spitting on him. Right? Even if they claim to be uh, followers of the Messiah, like the religious leaders are all mocking him. They're all claiming to be looking for the Messiah. Blessing the Messiah, blessing God, yet they're the ones mocking him and doing all this stuff to him. Like Jesus said, not everyone who calls me Lord, Lord will enter into the kingdom of heaven. They're going to say they're going to do all these great things in his name or done great things in his name. He's going to say, I never knew you. Right? So in the midst of all that, you still call on him. You still praise him. Right? And you put your flesh to death like Paul talks about. You die daily. You you put yourself up on that cross like this thief. Where your flesh can't do a thing. You can't nail yourself up there. So, you know, you got to get up in the morning there and pray. God put your flesh up on that cross. Because you need somebody to nail you there. Because if not, you're just going to follow your own earthly lusts. Or it's going to be a big temptation all day long. And I mean, if you're honest with yourself, you know it is. Because we all got stuff that about ourselves we don't like. But you know you always give in. Whether you're like, oh, I'm, I'm going to stop eating so much junk food. Uh, I'm going to quit smoking. Uh, you know, I am drinking a bit much. I'm going to stop drinking. I'm going to cut it down to just like the weekend or once a month. And, but you, you know, you keep getting caught up in it. Oh, I'm going to stop. I don't know watching so much TV, playing so much video games, whatever it is, I don't know. You know there's stuff that you like, I need to cut back on, or I need to be more active, but you you seem to have no control. Like You want to do these things, but your flesh is like, yeah, we're not gonna. Or you want to do these, uh, don't, you want to stop doing these things, and your flesh is like, no, we're gonna do it. Right? And you feel like you're just a slave to it. Well, that's why Jesus says he's come to set the captives free. Right? They got to be like that thief. Be nailed up there. 
where all you can do is go by faith. That's all you can do. You just kneel there and be like, oh, I'm I'm dying. I'm I'm a dead man. I'm a dead woman here. Uh, all I can do is have faith in you. Just remember me, God, because I can do nothing. I'm nailed to a cross. There's nothing I can do. I can't save myself. Oh, I can just hang here. And I and I deserve to hang here. Right? I mean, there's so much to the story. It's me all tied up and everything. I mean, it's it's lovely. It's deep. And it's it's all you really need. Like this this thief, he didn't have the Old Testament scriptures before him. He didn't have the Bible. He just knew he was a sinner. And he's going to die. And he deserves to die. And that God is just. God's just in letting him die and even going to hell. But he just cries out to Jesus, you know, remember me. Because when he's saying this, Jesus, Lord, remember me. He's calling Jesus just. He's calling him God. He's calling him the ruler. And he's saying that. You're the one that can forgive me. You're the one that can cleanse me. You're the one that can do it all. And he just put his faith in him. It's, but anyway, I think this this is why this picture, after saying all that, if you take some time, look into it, this makes this picture that much more touching. But anyway, thanks for watching and take care.